Hello and welcome everyone to the third History Bites of 2021, the 125 years of physics edition. My name is Anna Patterson and I am a visitor experience assistant at Guelph Museum. History Bites is a one hour long casual conversation during which we chat about the latest news, exhibition and other things going on at Guelph Museums. Join us on Facebook Live on the third Wednesday of every month at noon. A recording of today's History Bites will be available through the Museum Everywhere portal on our website and on our social media platforms after the broadcast. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I would like to focus our thoughts within an awareness and acknowledgement of the land. Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe people, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Through the Between the Lakes Number no. 3 Treaty Purchase of 1792, the Mississaugas of the Credit ceded to the British Crown over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to doing more to learn, share, and support truth and healing. When we started the History Bites uh, series, we spent time in close conversation about the land, its history, and its people. And we continue to build our knowledge and relationships in preservation and protection of the land. This commitment informs all that we do at the museum and includes today's conversation. So today's conversation is inspired by an upcoming exhibition that we will be hosting here at Guelph Civic Museum. Uh, it is entitled From Farmland Irrigation to Martian Exploration, 125 Years of Physics in Guelph. Uh, and I think we'll uh, pass it right over to our guests today. I, I would like to introduce Orbax here and Dr. Joanna Vera. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, no problem. It's exciting Our to be here. Our pleasure. We're very excited to have the upcoming exhibition. Um, and do you, uh, do the two of you want to talk a little bit about, uh, about the inspiration for the, for the exhibition that we're going to be putting on here? Sure. Sure. I'll defer to Dr. McMira. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, the great Orex. Um, so we're very proud of our history uh, in the Department of Physics. Um, we are last year in 2020, we were celebrating our 125th anniversary, which is actually older than the University of Guelph itself. Um, so the Ontario School of Agriculture and Experimental Farm was started in Guelph in 1874, and it became the Ontario Agricultural College in 1880. Um, and there, the first reference to the Department of Physics was in 1895 in the annual report for the Ontario Agricultural College. Um, and at that time, there was a faculty member named J.B. Reynolds, and he was really the, the first um, of the physicists that have worked at the college and now the university since 1895. So we wanted to do something special, um, and we wanted to recognize that long history. So we we got in touch with our great friends at Civic Museum and you guys were wonderful in, in uh, helping us put together this exhibit. Uh, we are, uh, we're very excited to have the exhibition coming up. As you said, we are, uh, we love working with you guys. We definitely have a, a very fun history um, of you guys coming to the museum and uh, causing the most fun kind of uh, <laughs> and destruction at the same time too. <laughs> and destruction sometimes too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but always uh, with this with an important dose of education, um, <laughs> which uh, which we love. So we're very excited um, uh, to have you guys. I really liked um, uh, one of the quotations uh, that you said from J. B. Reynolds, uh, where he says, "I believe the scientific farmer is going to be the farmer of the future." I thoroughly believe that if farming is going is to be made a success in this country, it has to be done on a scientific basis. Uh, and I, um, to me, that I kind of picture him in like a Jetsons kind of futuristic suit farming um, out in the field. There is is the image that that uh, brings up for me. Um, 
but uh, but do you want to talk a little bit about about um, his role and and that from the beginning the from farmland irrigation part of the uh, of the title? For sure, Orbex. Sure, yeah. I mean, it, it's an interesting thing because when the Ontario Agricultural College was formed, um, it seemed to be very much of the mindset that they taught practical farming to farmers who were in the uh, area and attending. And that the idea was that they were going to do away with the mumbo jumbo, with the mumbo jumbo being uh, sort of the higher heirs of a university. Um, with that very quickly didn't seem to be the case. Uh, they taught things like English because a lot of the farm community that was coming there was functionally illiterate. They taught things like mathematics because you're going to have to be able to do basic math, like uh, uh, figuring out your yields. Uh, and figuring out how much money you can make off of a certain crop. And that quickly sort of opened the door to this brand new thing that was happening in the late 1880s and the early 1890s, which was called electricity. And J.B. Reynolds especially was one of the first people who sort of had that forward-looking thought that the modern farmer would be using, at the very least, electrical devices, uh, lights, uh, and things like that, I mean, at the very most basic level, like like literally being able to put lights in a barn or include, yeah. increase your productivity by actually being able to see at night, let alone this idea of using um, higher electrical equipment. Uh, it opened the doorway to things like uh, being able to do irrigation, be able to do pumps, be able to drain wetlands. And I think a lot of the initial physics that started here was more of an embracement of practical science that was coming from physicists using a physics, mathematics, and engineering background. So it kind of just fell to the Department of Physics at the time to pull all of that together under one, um, pull all that together under one umbrella. Is that a metaphor that works in any way? And actually <laughs> look at it as a way of using physics to apply to the modern farmer. Yeah, so we have um, one example of the research that uh, J.B. Reynolds was involved in. He personally oversaw the packing of uh, fruit from Niagara Farms in ice uh, for train transport to Winnipeg, which was at the time like a seven or eight day journey. Um, and he demonstrated successfully that fruit harvested in the Niagara region could safely be transported to the West. And that opened up a whole new market for the farmers in, uh, in the Niagara region. You got to figure out stuff like this is completely revolutionary at the time because they weren't even really necessarily keeping track of weather patterns from year to year, growing seasons. A lot of that was just handed down from generation to generation, and there was no real science behind that. Um, so taking this scientific approach, even in so much as being able to do calculations, predictions, and models of how to do these things, really added a lot to agriculture at the time. That, uh, it, it sort of uh, connects with one of my favorite um, parts of reading through the uh, some of the early history of the physics department was the lightning strike yeah, so even an environmental phenomenon like lightning, right? Lightning can, especially at the time, could do terrible things to a crop. It could wipe out entire regions of your yield just by, by lightning strikes. And electricity was not that well understood at the time. So even doing something as simple as mapping out lightning strikes throughout Ontario and having that wealth of resources, that wealth of knowledge to apply to future generations uh, was an innovative thing that I, was that Reynolds or was that day who started doing that? I think uh, Reynolds, Reynolds was, started it. Yeah. And then the next tire in the, in physics was, um, W H day and he continued on the work with lightning. Um, and in fact, the work done by Reynolds and day around lightning led to, um, the Ontario government in, I think it was, uh, 1921 or so, um, having, uh, implementing recommendations on, uh, the manufacture and installation of lightning rods to protect property on farms. Um, and the, the work that Reynolds and Day did um, led to, they, they predicted that um, for every $1,000 of property damage done, a lightning rod would save $999 of that 1,000. So it was a worthwhile investment, I guess, was the bottom line. Absolutely. <laughs> It's kind of interesting that to me, though, sense. that, you know, you, you kind of take this stuff for granted in the modern world in which we live. But even only 100 years ago, things like lightning rods were an innovation. 
absolutely. And you have to figure too, you know, with, with physics at the time, I, you know, I think it's easy for us, especially post 2000 to kind of look at the sciences as these severely fragmented topics uh, that are going to a wealth of knowledge about very minute and at times not overlapping elements. Uh, and back then people were more or less polymaths where a physicist was an engineer, was also a chemist by necessity, was also a mathematician. Um, and applying these ideas to agriculture was kind of a neat and interesting new thing. They even, he even did this idea of soil analysis, which is huge now in terms of increasing yields, but looking at the composition or the makeup of the soil in terms of the amount of nutrients versus the amount of topsoil versus the amount of hummus uh, or humus. How do you say that? I'm not sure. The one, the one that you don't eat. I, how, how much of that is actually <laughs> in the soil in terms of not only just increasing your yield, but doing things like aiding in drainage, aiding in um, irrigation, aiding in uh, the transfer of water. So much of this had not really been studied, I guess, at that time. And you figure Canada's Absolutely. pretty young at that point too, right? For sure. That's true. I think they it's interesting. That, oh, no, 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 go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it's interesting that I, I don't think when you hear the, when you hear someone say physics, you don't think soil analysis off the top of your head, or a layperson doesn't at least. Um, so it's it's fascinating, like you said, all this interconnection of uh, of the scientific fields. Yeah, hundred percent. It's it's really pretty neat, um, and it's unclear to me. Joanne may have a, a bit more insight of this, but it's unclear to me at the time of the creation of the department in eighteen ninety five if there was actually any other physicists working there. Uh, is it just Reynolds as the head of the department and then a, a bunch of assistants and that kind of makes up the physics department? Um, that, that was sort of my impression. So um, a lot of this is based on, as Anna said, the reading about the early history of the department. And this is a little um, booklet that was written by one of our uh, retired faculty members, Jim Hunt, who uh, sadly passed away just a few months ago, back in October of 2020. Um, he wrote about the history of the department from 1877 to 1964, which of course was the year that uh, the Ontario Agricultural College became the University of Guelph. And uh, it was it's kind of hard to piece together in uh, Jim's uh, history, but it seems like in 1895, J.B. Reynolds was the physics department. Um, and <laughs> for a few years, he had uh, student assistants. And then um, in, when was it? 1903, I believe, yeah, 1903 was when uh, W.H. Day was hired. Um, and actually, three years after he was hired, he became the head of physics. Yeah, and Reynolds quit, right? Did yeah, he? Reynolds, Reynolds decided that his first true love was actually English, and he became the head of the English department um, and left physics to the hands of W.H. Day, who'd only been there for three years, which is a little unusual in this day and age, but um, but yeah, so it seems like it was a one or two, maybe three kind of person operation for much of the early years of the, the department. Well, and it's and it's also it's an agricultural college at the time too, right? So it's not like they're taking on graduate students or they have um, people who, who are coming to OAC to actually specialize in physics and mathematics. There, it's more of a service uh, department where they're teaching elements of it to people who are going to be doing agriculture production. Right, absolutely. In fact, we don't we didn't have anyone um, getting a graduate degree from physics until 1950. So uh, it was all. Well, 55 years or so where there was, uh, yeah, no graduate program in, in physics at all. Wow. And just to but compare, again, it's, how, it's, it's, how many is there in, in your department now? Oh, oh there's, there's three. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So <laughs> just the last hundred years, we've, we've and tripled there. the total number in the last hundred years. <laughs> No, actually, so our uh, faculty, we have 20 faculty in the department um, and we have a number of staff and we have uh, our, our undergraduate program is something like 250 students now in various programs. Um, we've got more than 50 grad students in our program. So it's, yeah, it's quite different from um, the days of J.B. Reynolds running the show and being the show. Yeah. And, and the topics that, you know, our students study run the whole gamut from 
uh, particle accelerators such as Triumph and CERN to even uh, putting material up on the surface of Mars and the Martian rovers. So, which is actually kind of the nice wraparound of this whole idea of the, 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 the of, of, our, of our exhibit is that, you know, in 1895, physics at the University of Guelph started very much with environmental analysis, soil sampling, soil physics, trying to understand how the world around us worked. And then 120 years later, 125 years later, we're doing the same thing, but now on a different planet. Uh, you know, the APXS device, the alpha, oh geez, I should know this, alpha particle X-ray spectroscopy. Yes, sure. Spectrometer, I think. Spectrometer. Alpha particle X-ray spectrometer uh, is on sitting on the Opportunity and the Curiosity rovers on the surface of Mars right now, uh, analyzing soil and telling us what the makeup is of the surface of Mars. Wow, that is <laughs> cool. Yeah, super cool, right? I, it's so cool uh, to go from a, an agricultural college to a, an intergalactic agricultural college. Soon we'll be, um, soon we'll be farming on Mars, the planet absolutely. of Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's absolutely fascinating, and and I think so cool that Guelph has that, um, that the university has that expertise and the reputation and all of those things. I think people, local people, can be super proud of uh, of the. Um, uh, I've lost the word, but um, the, uh, the impacts of the university or the. The word is gone from my brain, but uh... well, it, it, it's it's interesting because because <laughs> you know people don't necessarily think of Guelph as a hotbed of physics. I don't think, but you know we've grown our little humble little department with its agrarian roots has really grown into a world class physics department um, that's constantly creating innovation. Uh, a few years ago, probably probably most well known in the news, uh, Dr. John Dutcher started a company called Marexis um, that's creating tiny nanoparticles out of corn. Basically, these biodegradable little tiny particles that have a unique or monodisperse um, variation with them, where it just generates this tiny, tiny, tiny little particle. It's like on the order of microns in size that are all the same that they're using now for to looking to use for delivery of pharmaceuticals or for makeup or all these other types of things that they're using tiny plastic particles for now, except these are biodegradable. So there's all types of innovation that happens within this department that probably is not as well known as. Some of the other bigger, you know, you think of physics, you think U of T, maybe Waterloo, but Guelph has this thriving department of its own that doesn't necessarily get as much press. Absolutely. Well, I think the presence on Mars will hopefully <laughs> change that. That is super cool. Uh, now that we, well, we've kind of talked about the exhibit and, and the inspiration for the exhibit. Um, would you like to share some of some of the uh, the artifacts behind you there that are going to be on display in the exhibit? Sure, there's all types of stuff here. I can um, I can move the camera around. Maybe it's best to tag team while I'll bring things to the camera and maybe uh, Joanne can tell us what we're looking at. I can throw in my two cents here and there as well. I'll still have my microphone with me. Um, what would you like to start with, uh, Dr. O'Meara? Um, there's a balance behind you. I Let's can see. It. <laughs> so uh, Orbax and I have had a lot of fun digging around in the archives of um, the McNaughton building. Um, McNaughton building being named after Earl McNaughton. What are you doing? Um, who uh, actually was the first faculty member hired in our department who had a PhD in physics. Um, he started in the department in 1949, just after the Second World War, and, and he was a major uh, figure in the evolution of our department from this very applied um, agricultural uh, department into, um, you know, really all, all disciplines in physics. Okay, so we're looking at a balance. So this would be something to try and uh, equilibrate, um, weigh something. So you'd have standard weights that you would put on one side and then you'd put your sample on the other side and you'd figure out how much that object weighed. Um, I, the thing I loved about going through all these archives is just looking at the workmanship with which these things were put together. <laughs> I mean, the cases are so beautiful, um, just beautiful wood and brass fittings. And um, it was just, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. We've also been trying to figure out what some of these things are. 
So to the right of that balance, I believe, yes. So this device is very elaborate um, and it is a device for tracking rainfall over the course of a week. <clears throat> so you can, you can see in there, there's a, a piece of paper that's blue paper with graduated lines on it. And it was, there would be a pen um, attached in front of the, the rolling drum. The drum was run by a brass clockwork that's mounted on the, the side there. And the drum would turn and the pen would record the amount of rain that fell. Um, and this appears to be a custom made piece um, specifically for this, this measurement. Uh, we've been in contact with a few um, organizations that collect uh, antique analog scientific measurement devices and nobody has ever really seen anything quite like this. Um, we so we've been trying to follow the clues of the various bits and pieces to figure out how it worked but it looked like there was you see there's a wire hanging off that edge of that that arced shaped piece of brass that goes through a hole at the bottom of the um case which we think probably had a weight or a bob maybe on it that was uh resting on the the surface of of a collecting um, container so you could check how high the rainfall was there. Judging by the qual the, the condition of the case, it's beautiful. It doesn't look at all um, weather beaten. So we don't think this was outside um, collecting water and measuring. There must have been some sort of outside collection container that was then fed through. Um, you can see on the left hand side, there's a hole in the glass that possibly that was how the water was fed through into the device. So um, it's just, uh, it's just been so fun looking at all these amazing pieces and, and just trying to figure out, okay, what, what are these different things doing? Fortunately, this one was, we know it's definitely rainfall because it says on the piece of paper, um, one inch on the paper equals two inches of rainfall or something like that. So we know that's what it was for, but, but it, how it probably, actually worked is is still a bit of a mystery. It's interesting too to keep in mind that you know, come uh, for something that's like a, the turn of the century in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Even something like average rainfall wasn't something that was commonly being computed. So this is again really innovative materials and innovative research that was taking place just in terms of saying, okay, well, is there any sort of predictive model? Are we going to know anything about? future years based on the fact that it rains more in this month during another month uh, and so on. So just applying the scientific mindset to agriculture at the time was really an innovative idea. What other pieces do you have behind you there? <laughs> All right, well, let's see. We've got all types of things here. Um, <laughs> this is a, 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 a soil thermometer from the early 1800s there if we take a look all this stuff is so gorgeously like engraved um and this would be uh, a thing as a probe on the end of it here that you'd be able to then shoot into the dirt and push down and actually get a measurement of the of the temperature of the soil you know and you would do this take measurements of how far down um you know a meter a few feet what's the temperature there uh, this it, a lot of it is is, is typical sort of Barometric pressure of barometers. Um, this is a, a stormograph, I believe. <laughs> um, again, this this line here, there would be a drum, and this lever across here is actually a pen on the end of it. So as the drum would turn, you would record with this pen. Um, but you can see there's a series of. I wonder if I, can, I think I can open this up. There's a series of different coils in here that actually respond to the atmospheric pressure and give you a reading of the barometry of this so you know if a storm is is coming up or inclement weather you would notice that these would change dramatically as a result uh the expansion the contraction of this which would then trigger this and you would see a variation in the line weight um again immaculately kept in condition um and just a gorgeous piece to look at if you like looking at old equipment here um I guess we should look at uh, uh, Dr. O'Meara's favorite piece. Now we're currently <laughs> having a debate as to what's the cooler name for this item. Uh, 
I would uh, prefer to call it a, since it's a solar, uh, uh, sorry, we're just having a, it's just, so somebody just came in the room. It's okay, everything's still safe. Uh, <laughs> we have a solar recording sphere um, that Joanne is also calling the sunshine o meter. Yes. So whatever you think is better. Now this is a, just a, a what appears to be a normal crystal ball. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that it has a defined focal length. So it's like having a lens, right? Light comes through it, light is focused into a discrete point. And this is the base of the mount. So this setup here would be a base that this would sit inside of. Now, this wraparound piece of the base would typically have some kind of um, photosensitive chart paper inside of it. So as the sun shines down, the light focuses at individual locations and spots to this. And as it traces its map through the sky, you can actually get a chart showing how many hours of daylight that you actually have at a given time. Um, so it's incredibly heavy. So this will all be made out of like cast steel uh, with this piece in the center as a location. You could put this wherever, um, indoors, outdoors, probably at a higher vantage point than others in order to actually trace that type of measurement. And what was the date on that one? I think there's a date stamped on the front of that. Is I don't put it down because it's so heavy. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I don't see the date. Oh, 18, 1895. 1895. So the same age as our department. Um, now, again, uh, uh, electricity, electrical devices were a huge part of that uh, beginning of that department. Um, Tesla had just started creating Tesla coils in the late 1800s. Um, Edison with the light bulb was right around that point as well. So you're looking at the, um, perhaps I guess, oh, maybe only 10 years after that starts to become publicly available, uh, the university opens or the Department of Physics forms. And so we've got a bunch of uh, electrical equipment, electrical measuring devices from the early 1900s. Uh, this is uh, an old ammeter. Um, so that would measure the electrical current in a circuit. This is a, another device here as well from 1901. I'm not entirely sure what this does, but uh, <laughs> it definitely does something. <laughs> um, uh, and even these types of like hand crank demonstrations of how to light up a light bulb and create a current just by moving um, an iron coil or an iron core inside of a coil. Uh, this is the same t blown up version of this is what would creating AC power at uh, Niagara Falls. Right. And according to Jim's uh, history, his little booklet in uh, 1896, the Ontario Agricultural College Dynamo was connected to the physics classroom so that they could do electrical experiments in the physics classroom. So a dynamo is a device that converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. So the college had a dynamo and, uh, and the physics uh, classroom was connected to it so that they could do those important electrical experiments. Um, Jim also talks about the experiments that were done testing uh, the lightning rods. Um, and it involved a friction based uh, voltage generator, which um, is commonly known as a Van de Graaff generator, um, which is a device that we have used in the museum um, many times. It's a very popular demonstration of static electricity. Uh, and uh, that's how they were experimenting. I mean, we, we kind of use it as a fun little demo that's uh, a vintage piece, but that was basic. Um, you know, cutting edge research at, at the time of the turn of the century. That's so cool. It's, it's so hard to imagine now that just the existence of electricity was the thing that was amazing. Um, just the fact that, like you said, you could turn lights on in a barn, that that, that is like the big thing that was, that was mm -hmm. going on. It's Absolutely. hard to imagine it today. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to connect to the community just up the road um, in Fergus in 1890, um, Dr. Abraham Groves was the built an electrical generator in order to run electricity in the new hospital in Fergus, new, new hospital in, at the time in Fergus. Um, and uh, he actually extended electrical service from Fergus to Laura in 1900. So, you know, that was really a, a major development at the time. And, and, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it is hard. It's impossible for us to imagine what life would be like with, without 
all of our modern conveniences. Absolutely. We certainly wouldn't be able to <laughs> be having this conversation, that's for sure. Um, I don't think there was a time before Zoom, if you can even imagine that. I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember it now. <laughs> I have to say, I do, uh, I do quite like the sunshine meter. That, uh, that is a very cool device. Solar recording sphere, yes. you mean? <laughs> no, sunshine o meter. Yeah, it's neat. And I mean, the, the, what I've always loved about, about physics and about physics demonstrations and displays is always the simplicity in them. Um, it's this, this drive to sort of remove all the possible external factors uh, and just isolate one principle or one idea without other things interfering with it. Um, and you see that on display in a lot of these pieces of equipment, just simple simply elegant ideas that are manifested in this type of equipment to make vital measurements. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, it is kind of amazing to think of the impact that, um, you know, our, our predecessors in physics at the Ontario Agricultural College had. I mean, I mentioned the 1921 um, manufacture and installation of lightning rods, which was a, a huge um, thing for Ontario farms. Um, the, the Holland Marsh, um, which I know a number of people will know is a very, uh, a hugely fertile stretch of farmland just north of Toronto. Um, we mentioned before W was it W H Hall? No day. Okay. Um, day. He was the second, uh, physics, uh, faculty member after Reynolds and he continued on the soil analysis, but he also became very involved in irrigation and drainage. Um, and he actually, with his brother started a side business of, um, ditch digging. Um, and this actually ultimately led to his resignation because there was a lot of, uh, tension between day and the university administrators over um, perceptions of conflict of interest, because he had this side job of, of ditch digging for uh, Ontario farms and was also a public ser servant working for the Ontario agricultural college. Uh, but anyway, he was a huge player in the draining of the Holland marsh um, and turning it into this viable farmland just north of Toronto. Um, he led a consortium of, of people in that operation and and he owned a farm there after he resigned from oac in 1919 he moved to bradford um near the holland marsh and had a farm there and um in 19 let me get this right 35 i believe was the first harvest of uh vegetables from the holland marsh from his farm um, and it has continued to be a major source of fresh fruits and vegetables for the greater Toronto area um, since that time. That's really cool. How much, um, how much of what is done today at the physics department is still connected to kind of agriculture? Um, is it, uh, is there a lot you know, that's I definitely I your range has expanded. I liked in the description it uh, the scope ranges from subatomic to astronomical. Uh, but is there, um, you know, do, is does that kind of tradition of agricultural focused work continue at all? Or, you know, um, um, not very you much. Do? Not very much. I actually, I will just go back and correct myself. It was 1927 was the first crop from Day's farm in the Holland Marsh. Um, so uh, Orbach's already mentioned our colleague, John uh, Dutcher, who has that, that company that spun off that comes from um, analyzing the, the substances of sweet corn. So there's that connection. Um, the only other connection that I can think of off the top of my head was um, a project that I was involved in when I first started at the University of Guelph. So my background is medical physics and in particular in measuring heavy metals that people are exposed to through their work generally. Um, and when I first started at the University of Guelph, um, when you're hired as a faculty member, you have to give a talk about what your research is. And I gave my talk and at the end of the talk, there's always questions. And this one gentleman put up his hand and he said, I was wondering if you would be able to measure silver in cow udders and for one brief moment i thought is this some kind of guelph hazing that you know <laughs> they're gonna throw 
a dairy cow question at a physicist at, in the middle of their research talk. But anyway, I played along and it turned out it was a very serious question. Um, and after I was hired, I was working with um, Howard, who was in the um, veterinary college. He was the radiologist at the time. And we did, we took our detection system over to the barn and we measured um, silver in the, uh, under the skin of a cow udder. Um, and the application is that um, in the dairy cow uh, showing world, um, the cattle are judged based on a number of things, but one thing is the the confirmation of the udder. It's very important in how the cow does in a show, and how a cow does in a show can be very important to the worth of uh, the herd or that cow in particular, the value. Um, so people were cheating, um, and they were cheating by um, augmenting the appearance of the udder by injecting small amounts of silver under the skin, which caused an inflammatory reaction. Um, and the reason they had this silver compound around is because it's an antibiotic that's commonly used uh, to clean um, before you milk the cow. So they were injecting small amounts of silver that would cause an inflammation that would enhance the appearance. And so we were uh, able to show that we could detect this cheating um, with our X-ray fluorescence technique. So other than that, I can't think of any other <laughs> agricultural examples. Or Max, how about you? Um, well, I mean, people are, we, we do get approached occasionally for different types of projects. I mean, the OAC, the vet college, everything else is still like, like Joanne says, a huge part of the school. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in our department, uh, especially in the first year service courses that we do for the biological sciences, um, physics and the biosciences, that has a lot of practical application to biology, um, but probably not so much as agriculture as it, as it used to be back in the day. I think you really saw a change take place in the 60s uh, when we joined the University of Guelph when it was formed, um, that a, a big push kind of moved away from soil physics and more towards uh, neutrons that had been sort of discovered at the time and the move into the Atomic Energy Commission of Canada was pushing really heavily in the late 60s. Um, so a lot of our research kind of started moving in that direction, which I think really in the end opened the doors for uh, so much of the variety of what we do today. Um, but there is a thriving biophysics component as well here, uh, part of the department, as well as a, a nanoscience program that also uh, looks a lot at the inner workings of small things that do have biological applications. So we might have moved a little bit away from this idea of soil physics and of measuring rain and move more towards looking at the actual parts of molecules and tiny little bits that make up all the bio stuff. Very cool. Thank you. Um, I sort of the other uh, question that that I have is um, where do you do you have any predictions of where department or the study will kind of go in the future from, you know, from from soil uh, to uh, subatomic particles and uh, astronomy. Do you have any kind of um, do you want to take a wild guess at where uh, what you, what people will be talking about another 125 years from today? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, physics is an ever evolving science and there's always something new and interesting to understand or to try to figure out. So my hope would be that in 100 years from now, we're still trying to figure out interesting, unique things that make up the universe in which we live. Um, what that will be at that point, who knows? I assume there's always going to be a focus on nuclear science and atomic science, always going to be a focus at Guelph on biophysics and the integration of biology and physics. Um, but from there, the sky is the limit. I mean, honestly, at this point, the sky led us all the way to Mars. So who knows where it'll be going after that? Joanne? Yeah, no, I, I like to, I, I, as we were going through all these pieces, I kind of kept thinking, wow, can you imagine what J.B. Reynolds would think if he were to see um, what this, his little department of one <laughs> and maybe a student assistant had become 125 years later. I mean, all the amazing things that that are taking place in our building. We have a particle accelerator in the basement of the McNaughton building. Um, you know, like the just the amazing uh, research and, and teaching that we do in the department. It, it 
I, I would like to think that he would be just completely filled with wonder and awe and, and so impressed with kind of what started with him being hired after doing his bachelor's degree at U of T um, and moving down the road to, to this agricultural place and, and, uh, and now what it has become over 125 years later. So I doubt he would have been able to predict that, and I do not in any way attempt to predict <laughs> what would happen 125 years from now. That is fair. <laughs> That's very fair. Uh, before we we wrap up, uh, are there any um, sort of ongoing projects or or any anything else related to the exhibition that that you're really excited about um, or that you want to talk about at all? Um, in, in uh, study and, and research or in terms of, you know, the, what you've learned putting the exhibit together? Well, I'll, I'll go. I say that what I learned in putting the exhibit together is that we have an incredible um, uh, archive of, of uh, pieces of equipment that mm -hmm. we just scratching the surface of what's there and what it is and how old it is and what it does. Um, and in, in getting in touch with some of these groups that um, are advocating for the collection and display of these old pieces, what I would like to do is, is have a concerted effort to try and chronicle what is there and really have a bit of a deeper dive into what these things do, maybe create um, a website for the department that showcases all of these pieces um, and really highlight the, the long and um, incredible history that we've had in this community and, and the impact that we've had. Um, we're kind of a, we're a relatively small department, but I, I, I like to think that we're small, but mighty and, uh, and just try and showcase a little bit that history, I think would be a really fun project to dive into next. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if anything, um, you know, it was difficult for us to trim down artifacts that match this project thematically. Uh, there's a whole whack of cool stuff down there um, that, I mean, is, is you know, on the order of a, a century old. Uh, and it just really sort of, of mirrors this idea of physics being this, that a physics demonstration can be this beautiful, simple, timeless thing when we can look at this equipment that was used 100 years ago and understand and see how nicely it worked and would still work today. Um, I think a lot of the techniques with which we, we, we sort of do physics education has changed. Um, a lot of it's moved from the classroom to online uh, to virtual. And for all of your needs with that, please go sign up to the Guelph Physics YouTube page. That's youtube.com backslash Guelph Physics. And you can join us. We've been doing a, a monthly stream or I guess it's a two weeks now uh, streaming series where we talk to a lot of different alumni who are working in different varied fields of physics, from medical physics to Martian exploration. Um, we have one coming up on quantum compute computing. So it's, it's really interesting to see kind of the spectrum of, no pun intended, um, the spectrum of what our graduates uh, have learned and gone on to do and of what types of materials that we teach here. Um, so definitely check that out. That's well physics on YouTube. <laughs> That's a great plug. Um, I do have one last question before before we finish up. Um, where where you're sort of storing these um, these artifacts and things? Are th were they um, intentionally kept as part of like an archive and and um, uh, so like an, an intentional storage of the artifacts related to physics, or was it kind of oh we don't need to use this device anymore? We'll put it in the basement. Um, is that how, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we still use some of them. I, I mean, I still, I, I've used not, not all, not necessarily this equipment, but I use some of the stuff that we have from the early 1900s um, when I'm teaching uh, to show and to demonstrate kind of the differences in the way things like uh, capacitors, ammeters, electrical devices, how they've revolutionarily changed, even not just in purpose and in scope, but in size over the last hundred years. So, I mean, I, I, we, we do use a lot of this stuff to actually uh, to, uh, to, to demonstrate physics still. Yeah, our Van de Graaff generator is a very popular item. Um, but yeah, no, it's, I'm sure professional museum curators would probably have a minor heart attack if they um, 
saw the kind of uh, random space that we have these things jammed into is actually um, in McNaughton, our McNaughton building, which is where the physics department is, there are two big lecture rooms. One seats about 300 people, and that's a tiered uh, lecture room. Underneath that um, tiered seating is where we store a lot of our demonstration equipment and a lot of these um, antiques are in uh, in the very, very back of that of that area on shelves. Fortunately, some of those shelves were labeled as you saw on a couple of those pieces that Orbex was showing. There was the, uh, a label that said soil thermometer. So that helped us <laughs> quite a bit as we were going through the pieces. Oh, apparently this is a soil thermometer. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's been a bit um, ad hoc, I would say in um in holding on to these things but i would really like to see that now recognized and and celebrated um and so yeah i'd really love to see um something come out of this that's more permanent absolutely well i'm so happy that the museum is involved in the start of this uh Ooh. uh sort of showing them off show, showing off what you have and it sounds like there's a thank ton of so material for, for more exhibitions down the road yeah thank Absolutely. you so much for giving us the opportunity to do this this is a an exciting impetus to start a project of categorizing and uh, putting together these historical artifacts so thank you so much for this chance yeah. well on behalf of the museum i can say our pleasure uh we uh we love working with you guys, and those are some very, uh, very fancy looking pieces of equipment back there <laughs> that I'm sure our visitors are going to be really excited to learn more about and see yeah. uh, see what they do. And I, I've discovered in our research that our um, our fascination with blowing things up is uh, goes back to the 1920s with uh, one of our predecessors was doing research on using explosives to clear uh farmland so uh when we come and blow things up at the museum it's it's just it's perfect it's just coming from our carrying on a rich history rich, rich history exactly. of blowing stuff up part of a long <laughs> tradition <laughs> and we look forward to continuing that tradition with you <laughs> absolutely well, thank you so much joanne and orbax for for talking with us today about the exhibit about the department and about all the absolutely fascinating things that you guys are working on um we're so excited to have the exhibit up we're really looking forward to uh to people coming and uh and seeing it um definitely uh check out you know keep an eye on our website guelphmuseums.ca for more information about uh when the exhibit will be up and ready and available to the public um and of course maintaining all of our uh, safety guidelines as people come to visit the museum uh, but on that note, thank you again so much from Guelph Museums uh, for for joining us today, and for those of uh, for those of you watching at home, thank you for uh, for tuning in. Thank you, Anna. Thank you Have so a much. Fantastic day. Bye bye. <laughs>